Next on BYUSN, moral victory. Wait, were there any moral victories in BYU men's basketball's loss at San Diego State on Friday night? Love that subject. And what do we want to see from Cougar football in the final two weeks against Utah Tech and Stanford? A whole lot of actual victory. Welcome to BYU Sports Nation, presented by the BYU Store, official outfitter of BYU fans everywhere. It is Monday, November 14th, wherever and however you have chosen to connect. Great to have you with us. I am Spencer Linton, teamed up alongside Jerem Jordan, and you may be wondering why there's red and blue in the studio today. Well, that's not red, it's burgundy. That's a great point, that's and I'm, not gl- red. I'm glad you, I'm glad you brought red. that up. Why would we wear red here? I'm that's, getting some trash about it this morning. It's not red, it's burgundy, and it's representing a former BYU guy. Who? Dax Mill, my, my friend Dax Mill. Let me turn around. We're, we're, uh, turn we're pretty yeah. aware who plays Spin for Spin around in the chair. Oh, can you see the name? Oh, there it is. Now, now we can. Okay, yeah. now you, see, now yeah. you can see it. All right. Yeah, yeah. On today's show, ESPN's Trevor Maddox, who played for Washington as well. He talks about Utah Tech, Stanford, the top priority uh, for BYU in the next couple of weeks. It, is BYU one of the most frustrated fan bases in the nation? Who said that? Do we agree? Men's hoops lose at San Diego State, as mentioned. We'll discuss where the Cougars are through two games. And uh, do we like the show, meaning San Diego State student section, uh, how they were way nicer on Friday? Like, what's going on there? Here are today's headlines. Hey, how's this for a moral victory? BYU men's basketball leads the majority of the game against San Diego State on Friday night, but ultimately loses to the 19th ranked Aztecs 82-75. BYU, turnover problems again. They had 20 on the road. Shot just 16 free throws to the Aztecs' 37 bounce back opportunity for BYU as they host Missouri State this Wednesday at 9 p.m. Eastern. Cougars in the NFL, Jamal Williams scored a touchdown with 221 in the game with the PAT giving the Lions the win against the Bears. Sione Takitaki had 10 tackles in the TFL and a loss to the Dolphins for the Browns. How about those Lions and Jamal? More from Cougars in the NFL. Fred Warner finally got his head to head win over Kyle Van Noy. As the 49ers beat the Los Angeles Chargers last night, 22-16. Warner had seven tackles, three pass deflections. Kyle Van Noy had a couple of tackles. And former BYU man Michael Davis had six tackles for the Chargers in that loss. As mentioned, Dax Milne and the Washington Commanders play tonight against the undefeated Philadelphia Eagles on Monday Night Football. An 11-and-a-half-point underdog are the Commanders. Should be a really interesting first quarter. <laughs> Women's soccer beat Utah Valley 3-0 in the first round of the NCAA tournament thanks to goals from Tara Warner, Ali Fryer, and Rachel McCarthy. Cougars play Stanford Thursday, 2 Eastern on BYU Radio at North Carolina. Let's keep the vengeance tour rolling. BYU women's soccer with a huge challenge ahead. How about 18th ranked BYU women's volleyball sweeping St. Mary's on Saturday. You're watching some basketball highlights. We'll get to that in a minute. But volleyball taking care of business. They win three sets to none. Aaron Livingston continues to be dynamite. 20 kills. BYU at Pepperdine Thursday, 10 p.m. Eastern. Women's Hoops lost 69-60 to Montana State in the home opener. Nani Falatea scored 17 in the loss. Cougars host number 15 Oklahoma tomorrow, 5 Eastern on the BYU TV app. Women's cross country places sixth in the NCAA Mountain Regional. It's on the Nationals now, as it is for men's cross country. We had a solid showing they placed second at regionals. Yeah, women uh, got an at-large. Obviously, they're in a uh, top 10 team. Former Cougar Taylor Sander wins the Huntington Beach opener uh, Open in the ABP with partner Taylor Krapp. Paul Asike and USA Rugby beat Hong Kong 49-7, setting up a winner-take-all for the final spot in the Rugby World Cup next year in France. How's that for drama? We will know about that in the middle of the show on Friday. Let's go. All rise and shout. It's time for What's Trending. What's Trending presented by BYU Food To Go, the MVP of your next event. Ah yes, for love of the game. But is there love for moral victories, Jerem? No. Moral victories. And were there any moral victories when you step back after the weekend and look at what BYU did against San Diego State on Friday night against the Aztecs? No. Uh, There's some apathy because uh, we're used to 20-plus turnovers, I guess, now. But uh, I, I don't know that we expect this team to go to the NCAA tournament, so we're not, like, ticked. Certainly disappointed. BYU led this game for 31 minutes on Friday night. BYU played a really nice game for most of the game. Unfortunately, lose the lead in the last five minutes, and uh, San Diego State wins by seven. By the way, Rudy Williams uh, down nine, line goes to eight and a half. 
Cougs cover with two free throws late, but three concerns I have so far, uh, Spence, uh, looking at this game and the Idaho State game. One, turnovers. 20 again, 43 total. That's way too many. Rudy Williams specifically had eight. He's got 12 on the season. That's tough. Uh, number two is fouls. BYU's being way more aggressive defensively. Sure. And that's awesome sure. that they're trying to guard better, but they're fouling a lot. Uh, 26 fouls resulted in 37 free throw attempts, plus 16 makes. And that's a big deal. BYU offset that with making threes. They made five more for 15 point difference. Which was so great. There's sort of your offsetting point. It was right? great, yes. But the lack of offensive flow is my third issue, Spence. 10 assists on 28 field goals in this game. That's now 19 on 50 made shots. 38% assist percentage would have been bottom three in the country last year. For sure. That's what BYU used through two games. So the lack of flow on offense is an issue. Certainly, um, you know, not turning it over, not fouling as much, figuring that sort of we're up at 11 on defense, can it be dialed back to eight or nine or something, and, and you don't turn it over, you don't foul, and now you on offense you distribute the ball a little better. Yeah, now, now BYU is in a position to win that game, to be way more interesting this year. And as Mark Pope said after the first game to you, hey, this is going to be a process all year. So I wasn't extremely frustrated by the loss because I didn't expect BYU to go down there and, and win per se. I, I hoped they'd compete better, and they did. But I don't really take a moral victory out of it because it's a rival at San Diego State. I'm not going to concede that. Now, the frustration comes in because BYU led most of the game. Yeah. And so now it's like, oh, wow, they're in position to win this game. Totally. And they just let it kind of slip away because of the things you talked about, led by turnovers. And, yeah, Rudy Williams is a guy that comes from Coastal Carolina, not surprisingly as an advanced and experienced player. Like, when he was at Coastal, he had a positive assist to turnover margin. And that a positive isn't enough, Spence. You got to be two to one that, to be real good. That's not shocking. You know I mean? Well, he wasn't quite two to one when he was at Coastal Carolina, so maybe we're seeing a little bit of that as he transitions over and taking on some tougher competition between at San Diego State. I don't know Idaho State though. I mean, he turned the ball over four times and had one assist. I just Rudy knows that he is better than this. Yeah, and, he'll and, be better. And than he's that. frustrated. And Tough start. We expect to see him play better and take better care of the ball. Yeah. He clearly has a capability to get to the hoop and create shots for his teammates. And he had a nice game outside of those turnovers. Yes. Like obviously those turnovers are Eight big. Eight turnovers. Deal. Fifteen points and like you know, three assists, three steals, uh, four rebounds, I think. So he had a nice game, but the eight turnovers are a big deal. I mean, I would honestly at this point, I, I would take one to one. Assist a turnover from Rudy Williams. Well, given how bad it's been from the team and Rudy individually, sure. And, and that deals you with adjust BYU's your expectations. style of play. I mean, they want to get up and down. They're just trying to play so fast and create tempo. And Mark Pope said in a timeout during the Idaho State game, he's like, you know what toughness is? Toughness is playing our style of game regardless of what the opponent is doing. Are we tough enough to impose our will on them and play our style of play. Like, we want to go fast. We want to play defense. We want to be disruptive. That's toughness. Show me some toughness in these final few moments. BYU survived catastrophe against Idaho State. And I thought, and I said on Friday, I was like, no way BYU is going to be able to play as fast as they want to play because San Diego State typically is going to slow it down and play defense. BYU sped the game up. Yeah. They did. And had a 10-point lead. So they were playing with, quote-unquote, toughness. Yes. I like that but it's not enough for a moral victory. BYU is in position to win the game and let it slip away, and so it's just frustration. Yeah. And, and you, you sure. need more ball security from your experienced players, specifically Rudy Williams. So while, while we asked each other on Friday, do we expect things to be dramatically different? We both said, no, we expect it to be different. But in some ways, it was dramatically different. BYU's three-point shooting was way better. Made nine threes. Way better. Competed with the team that we yes. think is going to be kind of sweet 16 good, right? Yeah, a uh, couple other notes. Uh, Jackson Robinson's got to shoot the ball better. Four of 17 right now, one of 11 from three. He's a, he's a, he can be a good shooter. I think he's going to be a good shooter. But Great right now, start. First few minutes on his, on his game right, on Friday night. Right now struggling. Foos has had two double-doubles. That's kind of been what we were hoping and expecting, the next step for him. That's been good. Spencer Johnson, though, we kind of buried that. Well, the lead is Rudy Williams' turnovers individually. But Spencer Johnson continues to be really good, man. 14 points a game, put up 17. He's made, a dude. He was made rocking a that car. Made a critical up. three, down six to cut it to three with a couple minutes left. So... Yeah, if, if we expected this team to make the tourney, Spence, we would be really upset today because BYU led that game for 31 minutes and didn't win. 
and it's a rivalry, and it's what's interesting too is this was a showcase game, not on TV because it was on your <laughs> view in San Diego, and it was streamed, and the bug's not working, and they don't even have an analyst, and da da da. They're doing their best, I guess. I don't know how this game wasn't picked up by somebody else, but anyways, we would have done it. But Mountain West, they're not going to yeah, let us in. Yeah. It, it is what it is. But uh, Gonzaga beats Michigan State by one on the aircraft carrier in San Diego. Jay Billis and Seth Greenberg, and then Bill Walton just shows up. They all go to this game. Like, this was a big game for those guys to watch primarily San Diego State, probably as a top 20 team, but also BYU, a quality program. It was an opportunity to sort of make an impression early, and unfortunately, BYU didn't take advantage there. Granted, again, expectations for this men's basketball team are not super high. I wouldn't say they're low, but I wouldn't say they're high. And so today we're not going, oh, my gosh. We're just like, eh, opportunity missed. That would have been nice to have a quad one win right out of the gate. But BYU nearly had a quad four loss at home. We're not going, you have to do anything. It, basically, don't lose quad three and four still. That's the only kind of standard I think I have for this group right now. Well, in a home game against Missouri State, may just fall into that quad three category, depending on who Missouri State is. Yeah, last year was, I think, a quad two. In because the it was on the road, yeah. BYU won that game, so yeah. it was a quality win. And BYU's got some wins right in front of them this week. Missouri State, take care of business at home. Nichols on Saturday. Uh, we got a doubleheader on BYU TV, by the way. Awesome. And then you go to the Bahamas and <laughs> come well, away with one win there, please. Who knows? That'd be good. USC lost a terrible game in their opener. Right. Last time BYU played, USC got worked in Connecticut. Hopefully, the Cougars show up and get a win in, in the opening game. And then you get a couple, maybe a couple quad one or twos, right? Uh, neutral site there in the Bahamas. Enjoy the Bahamas. But you got to get at least one win. And then you, you're a three and one, four and three coming out of the Bahamas. I, I don't think the coaches have to ask too much of their players to make a significant change. I mean, if, we're, if BYU could just get the turnover margin to, like, 16 a game, now we're talking about BYU being 2-0 and and handling Idaho State by double figures. I mean, they turned the ball over 23 times. Yeah. If you just get to 16, that's seven more possessions, seven more shot attempts. Two or three of those go in. BYU wins against Idaho State by 10. It's not crazy at the end. And then they hold on against San Diego State. Four more possessions that you don't give to the – the Aztecs, and the Aztecs turn those late turnovers from BYU into yes. points. And, and against Idaho State, BYU got Idaho State to turn it over 22 times. San Diego State only turned it over 10 times. By the way, this just in Aztecs 17 in the eight people. We're talking about, I mean, a, a minor change. But is that too much to ask? Like to take it from 21 and a half turnovers a game to 16 or 17 turnovers a game? We're not 16 even talking or about 17 is still too many. We're not even talking about doing something good. We're talking about not doing something bad. Yes, I feel like it's that simple through two games. Just value ball possession, and you should be okay. Yeah, that's the first one for me. I got I got other ones right. Fouling and, and offensive flow. Okay, topic two. What do you want to see out of Cougar football the next two weeks? Uh, let's see. I want to know what in the world BYU's ideology and thought process is with Jacob Conover. That was the first thing that popped into my mind when we led into the Utah Tech game was, okay, hopefully Jaron Hall doesn't have to play the whole game. I'm hoping he's out by midway through the third quarter. I hope BYU has done enough. So what do I want to see? I want to see BYU absolutely crush Utah Tech Mm -hmm. in the first half and maybe one drive into the third quarter They're up by four or five touchdowns. And then what's the ideology and process with Jacob Conover and Cade Finnegan? Because that will tell me a little bit about, hey, what the coaches want to do with those guys and do they trust those guys? Has BYU reached a point where they have to go all in on the transfer portal to find their starter for the Big 12? Or does Jacob Conover have something in him in a game atmosphere, a game environment? I just want to see him play. If it's not there, it's not there. If he's not trusted because, and I feel that he's not, because Jaron Hall has played hurt this year. Against Notre Dame, he didn't practice all week. Like Typically, you're like, okay, maybe we should go with the backup quarterback at least a little bit. They would have started. with Baylor Romney. Absolutely. You'd think. Absolutely. Yeah. Baylor Romney started the bowl game. Jaron Hall could have played last year's bowl game, but because the coaching staff felt so confident in their backup, an experienced backup, they went with Baylor Romney. I do not feel like that is the case with the quarterback scenario this year with Jacob Conover. So I, I am looking at that. What is the situation with Jacob Conover? Is he going to play? Are they going to make Jaron Hall play the majority of the game against Utah Tech? Holy cow. I mean, we've reached that 
type of scenario. And so that, that's what I'm looking for. And then, yeah, I want to see BYU dominate. And I want to see BYU take care of business against Stanford. They look terrible BYU can't Utah, have either. a scenario where, or a situation where it's Notre Dame losing to Stanford 16-14. to 14. Stanford's offense is so anemic. They're starting, a fourth, they're starting a defensive back at running back, by the way. Because they've had so many on, injuries. BYU has to beat Stanford. Like, you've got to win your yeah. last two games, be 7-5 and five going into a bowl game. Okay. If BYU plays, Jacob Connor in this game. We can't read into it at all. It's Utah Tech, and it's a big lead. It just doesn't tell us much. Um, we don't, we, we're going to go into next season, Spence, not knowing what Jacob Conover is. We're, we are, because Utah State's second half, he throws a little bit, they punt, and, and then Aaron goes, I'm just going to give the ball to Tyler. And that was a great, that was a great uh, strategy. It was a winning game plan for most games. I feel you on the Jacob Conover thing. I just don't think we can read into that at all. Even if BYU goes full bore and he passes, and let's say he throws like three touchdown passes, I don't think we can read into it. You're up a ton, it's Utah Tech. And blah, blah, blah. I just, okay, that was great, but it's Utah Tech. Because you know what you're going to do in game three next year? Play at Arkansas. And then you're playing uh, Baylor, Oklahoma State, Texas, Oklahoma, TCU, Texas. Like, who knows which four BYU doesn't play. But uh, I don't know if we can read into that. I actually only have one goal the next two weeks, and, and it's not as finite as, as yours. And I think we have – do we have a graphic for this? Okay. All right. Let's, Here, see, let's see the graphic. Do we have a graphic what is for you, this? What is your – Yeah, it's just when. <laughs> That's it. I, I don't I – don't. obviously, like um, – by the way, I – when I look at stuff like this, I always read it a certain way, like it's written. What Jerry wants to see in the next two. When? Like, that's, what the, that's how I read that in my mind. But, um, yeah, obviously, you got to blow out Utah Tech. And I would love to handle Stanford and then go at 7-5 and five to a bowl game, TBD, whatever. Hopefully it's coastal. It's probably not. But, like, that would be the only real, like, oh, yeah, juicy yeah, matchup. Bring it on. Everything else is, like, we'll make it interesting because uh, it's a bowl game. And if BYU goes eight and five, okay, great, positive yeah, momentum, yeah. good flow. Doesn't really, there's no connective tissue to me, really though, that BYU can build up into next year because it's just totally different. Now you're in a league. Now you have these new bylaws and off season. You don't have your like media day on BYU TV. Like it's totally different, right? Um, so no matter what, even if it's a disaster the next couple weeks, again, no connective tissue to me to next year. It's just full stop restart, almost like after the 2015. Vegas Bowl, where BYU lost disappointingly to Utah, and Kalani's hired, and we're like, we don't even care about it. what just happened. We got a new ball coach, y'all. Like, I think that's going to happen. Yeah, the, 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 there are a number of scenarios that I, that I don't want to see. Certainly, I don't want to see yeah. a close game in either regard. Yeah. Right? I don't want to see any more injuries. But I sure. would take close win versus Stanford. I'm not that picky with this BYU team even though Stanford's been bad. Because Stanford has a win, BYU doesn't. Notre Dame, yeah. right? It's <laughs> like, wild. We, I, I don't think we can be that picky with Stanford. Utah Tech, it's certainly you can't expect BYU to beat Utah Tech handily. Granted, they've got the spread and shed, uh, spread and shred offense, which is like It's a, Washington a State's great coaching name. staff. It's Washington State at the FCS level. Yes. What is it? Joey Hobart's got like 1,200 yards. Uh, Wazoo transfer the sophomore. He's awesome. But, yeah, they have some fun elements to them. Also, they got uh, Loney Fongupo, Jamison Clark, uh, you know, on the staff, former uh, BYU guys. Jamison Clark is the son of Steve Clark. So you got some fun storylines there. Rod Zundel calling the games on the radio, former KSL <laughs> guy. Old Zippy. KSL guy. Zippy yeah. Zundel. Yeah, it's great. It, it, it's a fun matchup. I like this game. And it's on BYU TV. Jerem, I hate that we, if BYU's up three touchdowns, Jaron Hall's still probably in the game. And that sends a message to me about – Well, then be up five touchdowns. Well, I, I want Jacob Conover to play even if BYU's up three touchdowns. I want, I want enough confidence in the backup quarterback that if it's a 21-point game in the second half, you're like, yeah, finish it off. And then if he crushes it – I won't read into it at all either nothing, way. Nothing. If he throws three picks, okay, well, I'll probably read into exa- that. Exactly. Exactly. But you can't do much for yourself, but you could hurt yourself. That's my opinion on that. <sighs> Interesting stuff. Let's hear from you in Voice of the Nation. Our question of the day is the one we just answered. Yeah. What do you want to see out of BYU football in the next two weeks? Final two games of the regular season. At Russell Grizz answers on Twitter. Utah Tech, I want to see the backups, mainly Conover, Fennigan, getting in the third quarter. Fennigan has an ankle injury. He's got a boot on. I'm not sure he's – well, maybe he'll be in position to play, but I'm not sure. So, Grizzfather says, Old I want Mayala. to see Conover in the third quarter. I hope we do see him in the third quarter. And it's not just a fourth quarter thing. that Jaron Hawk can get out of that game quickly. 
He said that probably means BYU being up by 28 plus for Conover to come in. Stanford, I want to see BYU finish the season strong, winning by 21 plus. Yeah, I, I disagree. I, I don't think with this group you can be that no, selective. Give me a, give me a, you know, somewhere a nine to 15 point win against Stanford. Solid. Are, it might be crazy to think that we should expect 30 plus point win against Utah Tech. Is that too picky for this group, given how no. much they've struggled with the offense? No, no, not at all. Okay, just asking the question. Just asking the question. No. The closest FCS game in the last whatever, 10 years or whatever, was like a 14-point game. It's Portland State yeah, on a six. historically yeah. bad BYU football team. But even then, 14-point win. Right. Okay. And that was, uh, yeah, yeah. I don't know. Put the 17-plus the That was the closest the test, margin Jared. of a Portland State loss all year, by the way, that year. <laughs> Join us Tuesday for BYU Basketball with Mark Pope as the coach and Greg Bell review the first week of the season. Look ahead to this week's game, Missouri State and Nichols. It's uh, tomorrow night, 8.30 Eastern on the BYU TV app. Up next, what does ESPN College Football Insider Trevor Maddich want to see out of BYU in the final two weeks? He discusses that and much more on BYU Sports Nation. This portion of BYU Sports Nation is presented by BYU Food to Go the MVP of your next event. We are live at Studio B with your day-to-day BYU sports play-by-play. Welcome back. I am Spencer Linton alongside Jerem Jordan, and we now welcome in ESPN college football insider and expert, one of our favorite analysts, back for another Maddich Monday. He is ESPN's Trevor Maddich. Trevor, how are you this fine Monday morning or Monday afternoon, depending on where you are? Right. I might be in Guam. Who knows? You are sporting some awesome colors there, Spencer. I mean, the last team I played for in the league, Washington, I'm loving the burgundy. Hey, this was purposeful for you and for the Washington Commanders punt returner tonight, Dax Milne. I'm rocking that number 15 behind me on this jersey. Very nice. I like it. You know what? He's been a valuable player for them because he has been secure for them. They can trust him. They know what he can do, and he gives them what he can do every time. And you can plan around a player like that. Yeah, huge asset to just have some reliable hands back there for sure. And we look forward to seeing what Dax can do against the water, the Philadelphia Eagles tonight. Trevor, as BYU begins the Utah Tech Week and are one win away from bowl eligibility, what are you hoping to see from Dax Milne's former team and a bunch of his colleagues on this BYU football program over the final two weeks of the regular season? To treat them like they're both the national championship game. And that means in practice, like they're practicing for the national championship game. So many of BYU's problems this year, as I look at the game tape, look to me as a player like guys weren't practicing the way they needed to, not just from a physical standpoint, more from a mental standpoint, because mental mistakes started some snowballs rolling against BYU this year that led to some real problems to have to overcome. And some of those problems, they weren't over, they weren't able to overcome by the time the game ended. And so what I want to see in these last two games are do the right thing in the right way and especially beyond anything else, because this is a bigger picture, 30,000 foot culture thing, stay together. They did that against Boise State. It would have been easy to go up there and and kind of point fingers and turn on each other a little bit, but they didn't. They drew together, and they need to keep doing that the last two weeks of the regular season and then the bowl if they make it. it and they're going to make it. Uh, they're going to beat Utah Tech and then make it. Um, it, it okay. They go to a bowl. <laughs> it's a given. Come on. Uh, if BYU wins out and they go 8-5, and five, did they salvage something, or is it still disappointing? You can't undo the disappointments that have occurred this season. And again, a lot of those are self-inflicted, and that's really unfortunate. No matter what happens going forward to finish the season, they can't undo that. But remember that it's easy when it's easy. And so when they're rolling and they're doing great and they're playing competitively against every top team they play and they're, they're waxing every team they should crush, all that stuff, you're on a roll and it's fun and it's great. It's easy when that happens. When things break down and when you're not getting the results you want and when there's negativity swirling around you, certainly from the outside in, if not in that building, it's a lot harder. 
So that's that's where they've been up until that Boise State game with four straight losses. And so I think the, the way to define this BYU football team and the way it will be defined will be how they do over the next three games and how they how they perform. That doesn't necessarily mean win them all. It would sure be nice if they did. But perform up to the capabilities that they have based on what they're being asked to do. And if they do that, then you can say about this team that even though things went south for a month, they rallied, they stayed together, and they showed you what BYU culture is. And that would be a legacy to be proud of. ESPN's Trevor Maddich is on BYU Sports Nation. Trevor, because BYU's roster is going to look so drastically different at some notable positions next year when they go into the Big 12 with the likely loss of Jaron Hall to the draft, and then Puka Nakua is probably going to go to the draft, Blake Freeland, Clark, Blank, Clark Barrington. There are a number of guys that have – really, really good shots to break into the NFL draft. Because it's so different, how much do you buy into the idea that BYU's program can create some momentum in the final weeks going into the Big 12? I think they can. And I think it's because even if the two offensive linemen that you mentioned declare, and I think certainly Freeland will, and he probably should, Barrington, you know, he might want to kick out the left tackle. He's 6'6", 305, playing guard. And so the, he might have more of an incentive to come back. But it, on offense, I think you'll still have an offensive line, regardless of what those two guys do. That'll be solid. You will have an outstanding young receiving core. And even if Jaron goes off to the NFL, then you've still got an incentive for the guys that are there and transfers to come in to increase the competition to play quarterback behind a solid offensive line and a dynamic young receiving core, right? And so, you know, I think, I think they'll be okay in that regard. I, what gives most hope? going into next year with all the changes that you might see, especially on offense to the key players, is the defense. I mean, depending on how you, you define starters and all the different position groupings and, and things like that, it looks like they'll only lose three guys off their potential starting lineup. And six of the of the the front seven defensive line and linebackers will be back if they choose to be. They have the eligibility to do it. And if they do, then this defense could go to from one that really struggled to one that is one of the, the best comeback stories year to year in college football. So th there's a lot of reasons to be optimistic about next year heading into the Big 12 with the personnel that they're bringing in right now. And we don't even know what recruiting is going to bring and what the portal is going to bring. Now, given what happened defensively, and uh, BYU struggled last year, again, they struggled this year, hopefully they get better. They didn't from last year to this year. The hope is they do from this year to next year. Does BYU need to consider some shuffling when it comes to who is coaching those guys? Does that need to be a strong consideration, at least in the offseason? Well, there needs to be a real evaluation, Jerem, of what the assistant coaches have been focusing on. We've talked before about how the, the coaches in this up-tempo age tend to often coach scheme on the field in practice, and then they coach technique in the meeting room because they just don't have time to stop and coach people up like it used to be when people used to huddle up and go more slowly. Well, you lose technique that way, and that hurts guys going into the NFL a lot of ways. And so they've got to take a hard look at themselves and decide if they're coaching enough football, how to play football, how to beat the guy in front of me, what techniques do I use? And we can go into the defensive line, for example. Um, you watch them on tape, and one thing I don't see is – Shock, extend, shed. That means that defensive line needs to shock the guy in front of him, the blocker in front of him, then extend him away so we can see what's going on. And when it's time to shed that blocker and pursue or make the tackle, shed it. Shock, extend, shed. Now watch that in the last few games of the season. See if they're doing that because there's too many times when that hasn't been the technique that, that we've seen. The linebackers for BYU tend to go side to side. They tend to stand there and wait for a blocker to get to them at linebacker depth rather than attacking downhill. Now, these are things that guys are being coached to do in large measure, and it depends on the game plan and the team that they're playing, and things can, can shake up and be different. But I think the, the coaching staff needs to take a real hard look in the mirror and decide if what they're asking their players to do is puts them in the best position to succeed. And if it is putting them in the best position to succeed from a, a scheme and technique standpoint, are they coaching those techniques enough that the guys can excel at it? Because this year, on tape, on game day, that hasn't shown up as consistently as it should have. It's another Maddox Monday on BYU Sports Nation. Trevor, 
maybe you just answer the question, and it is something with the coaching staff, but what's the number one thing that you feel BYU's program needs to address as they move into the Big 12 to be Big 12 ready? Well, to be Big 12 ready, we've seen as BYU has played an elevated Power 5 portion of their schedule the last several years that they've lost guys to injury. I mean, the Baylor game last year, they were just out of people on defense and Baylor just rolled them. This year, Baylor was earlier in the season and BYU beat them. They had more guys healthy. And that depth is very important. That depth is important because of competition that it creates in practice. It makes everybody better. And so from a, a, a micro standpoint and looking at what needs to happen, you know, on the field that we can see, it is more than anything else, continue to increase, to upgrade their recruiting so that they can continue to bring in that depth, especially on the defensive line, because you've got to have a rotation of eight guys where the, the second group is not a whole lot different than the first. BYU rotates guys like crazy. And what they do is they make up, and this is what a lot of teams try to do, they'll make up for a lack of dynamic playmaking on the defensive line by having the guys in there be incredibly fresh and play incredibly hard for a few plays, and then they go back out and they take a break, right? Well, if you combine that with the dynamic athletes, now you've got something going on. But overall, what will make BYU successful in the Big 12 is not that. What will make BYU successful in the Big 12 is their culture. Coach Sataki talks about that all the time. And when BYU is at its best, the, the culture is fantastic. The culture in the locker room holds their teammates accountable in a positive way, in a proactive, constructive way. And practice and preparation occurs in a way that shows up every week consistently on game day. That culture that BYU is known for when they're at their best is the key thing for their success, more so than even the, the, the players that we just talked about. I felt this way a year or two ago, and I still feel this way. I want to see if you do as well, is that in year one in the Big 12 next year, we don't know who the starting quarterback is, the starting running back probably at this point. We'll see. Is it make a bowl game? That's where we start with the goals, just make a bowl game? I think, I think it's make a bowl game. <laughs> make a bowl game is good, but it's be competitive. I mean, it, it's fight. If you go down, if you lose, go down fighting. Make sure that the other team knows that they were in a football game and the next day they hurt, you know, physically, just like you will be because you're playing that hard. That's what needs to happen because I'll tell you that the teams in the Big 12, top to bottom, there's no easy outs there. And it's going to be very, very physical. And so you can put a, a goal on wins and losses. That's fine. But you need to also look at how you win and how you lose. Because I look at, for example, you know, uh, Alabama lost two games this year, right? They had some problems. They, especially on defense, um, made some mistakes in the secondary, busted coverages, things like that. Wide receivers of Alabama haven't stepped up, dropped too many passes, things like that. Still, even with that, they go to Tennessee, one of the best offenses in the country, and they lose that game on a walk-off field goal on the road. And then they go to um, their second loss, which was LSU, and they lost the game on a two-point conversion on a walk-off at the end of the game. That's two walk-off losses on the road against teams that are currently ranked in the top 10. Well, in both of those losses, you could point to the mistakes that Alabama made and cost them those games, and that's fair to do. They lost. We have to figure out why. But it doesn't negate the other plays that put them in position on the road against top 10 teams to win, right? All those things happen. And that's what comes back to what we talked about with BYU here. It's not just they win, they lose. It's how they win and lose. Because if you lose a close game and you lose it at the end, it doesn't take away all the good things that you did in that game that you can build from. So it's important to keep those things in mind as well. Trevor, we'll finish with this. A couple of general college football playoff juggernauts in Clemson and Alabama are not in the latest CFP top four. So, some new contenders in there, including – TCU from the Big 12, who's got something special going on. Who are your top four teams right now, and who do you expect to be in the college football playoff when all is said and done? Well, right now I've got Georgia, Ohio State, Michigan, TCU. And TCU and Tennessee, at, at, I got Tennessee at five. They're really close, right? And so, so things will take care of themselves, though, a little bit because Michigan and Ohio State play each other. And especially if Ohio State wins that game then you'll probably have just one team in the Big Ten. The reason is the Michigan non-conference schedule is incredibly soft, and there won't be a lot of juice there for Michigan to, to 
rely on to make a case with the committee. If Michigan wins that game, Ohio State's win at the beginning of the season against Notre Dame is now looking better and better as the Irish have been looking better and better. So there's a possibility you might have two from the Big Ten. Also a good possibility you could have two from the SEC. So this will be fascinating. But I think that if if TCU wins out, which will be hard, they have a tough schedule, they will definitely be in the top four. A team to watch for is LSU. This is this is crazy. But there's never been a two-loss team make the college football playoff. And LSU with two losses controls their destiny. Actually, they've already clinched <laughs> the uh, spot in the SEC championship game. And if they can somehow knock off Georgia, which is not likely, but it's possible, then you've got LSU and Georgia both in the in the playoff. And you could have two Big Ten teams in the playoff with an undefeated TCU saying, hey, what about us? So there's all kinds of crazy things and chaos that could be happening. If you like chaos, stay tuned because this college football season could wrap up with a, with a fascinating train wreck. Fantastic stuff, Trevor. Great to catch up with you for another Maddox Monday. Be well. We'll do it again soon. Thanks, guys. All right. That, it is going to get weird. I don't, mean, with no Clemson and Alabama yeah. and some big moving no. parts, it's going to get weird a little bit. And don't dismiss USC uh, with one loss. And then North Carolina sneaky. What if they beat Clemson and only have one loss in the ACC title game out of that? Like they, not, They're probably out, but they're interesting. Yeah, 9-1 in and one North Carolina. I don't see two Big Ten teams. Michigan and Ohio State, losers out probably. But I could see if it's a close game for Ohio State and they lose, that Ohio, the brand gets you in a little bit there, right? Georgia's probably in at this point. I even, hope even TCU if they lose gets LSU. in. I hope the Big 12 has yeah. a representative. No, we're Big 12. Let's go. Uh, pro Big 12? I'm Absolutely. All, I'm all about They took care of business against Texas. Yeah, well, most teams have, you know. Uh, BYU Women's Basketball hosts 15th ranked Oklahoma. Speaking of the Big 12, what's up? Tomorrow, 5 Eastern, the Sooners have put up 97-plus in both wins this season. Watch the game live on the BYU TV app. And has the San Diego State student section, affectionately known as The Show, gone soft emotionally? We'll discuss next on BYU Sports Nation. BYU Sports Nation is presented by the BYU Store, official outfitter of BYU fans everywhere. Welcome back to BYU Sports Nation. Follow the program on social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, and TikTok. He is Jeremiah Spencer. Time to whip it. Cougar Whip Around presented by Marisk, your e-commerce logistics shipping partner. What's the ideal week for a bye week next year in the Big 12? Week 5. I don't know. Something early in the season that's not week 10 or 11, which BYU has done the past two seasons. You can't play 10 games in a row before you have your bye week. That's crazy, especially yeah, no. with the loaded schedules that BYU has played against the last two years. Just more injuries asking, or, you know, asking for more injuries. So I guess week four or week five? You've come around to the tough schedule equals injuries thing? Well, I, I mean, there's always part of that, right? Yeah. Playing that many in a row is, is more what I'm concerned about. Like, yeah. you need a break. It's even worse with that. Uh, ideally, week seven, halfway point. Uh, by the way, TCU's was week three, Texas week eight, West Virginia week six. Just a couple of games. Okay. Any of those better than week 11? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Bigger transitive property win or loss this season for BYU. Okay. A loss to UConn because Liberty lost to UConn and Liberty beat BYU. Or a win against Kansas because BYU beat Baylor and Baylor beat Kansas. Uh, recently bias on Liberty oh, uh, yes. with UConn. It's like, ugh, what? What? Hey, Jim Mora Jr. doing some great things. 41 players he picked up in the transfer portal in year one. Like, trying He's to the re anti -Dabo. rebuild that program. But still, like, losing to Liberty who lost to UConn, brutal. He's got a haunted house. Check it out on Bigger game transitive property loss there. Jamie Shepard and the women's soccer team avenged the loss in the regular season against Utah Valley, winning 3-0 on Friday night. Will the vengeance tour keep rolling against Stanford? I think they've got a better shot because the game's not in Palo Alto. Like BYU oh, has run into yeah. a lot of issues with Stanford, specifically in this soccer tournament in years previous. But it's in North Carolina. Neutral field, motivated team, playing their best soccer of the season. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to hop on that vengeance tour bus. BYU beat Stanford in its first two NCAA tournament games against the Cardinal. They have lost three since in 09, 15, and 19. 19 was ugly, like 5-1 loss. Let's go. Yes, compete. Just see if you can't do what they did last year, which is they went to Virginia, beat top seed Virginia in the Eastern time zone. Go uh, do it with Stanford. Vengeance tour bus. And then Let's beat go. North Carolina. BYU women's basketball now 0-2 on the young season under first-year head coach Amber Whiting. Yeah. 
BYU will next host number 15 Oklahoma, who averages 97 points a game. Then BYU's got to play a high-scoring Washington State team that's 3-0 in Hawaii. When will BYU women's basketball get their first win under Coach Whiting? I hope it's tomorrow, if not Friday. But uh, if it's not those two, it's certainly going to be Troy. So there's my really uh, soft stance. Troy's a decent team. <laughs> Troy is comparable to Montana State, who BYU just lost to at home. I'm hoping. I'm hoping it's before that, but it's probably the Troy game in Hawaii where BYU picks up their most likely first victory. It'd be tough to start on fourth. That'd be rough. Oof. Does BYU women's ba uh, volleyball chance to host first two rounds of the NCAA tournament right on winning out? Yes, because BYU probably has to beat San Diego in Provo to feel like they're going to be one of the top 16 teams in the country. Mm. There's not much oh. else that BYU can do to jump up the rankings from number 18. Well, and, and the rankings don't and matter. To help it's, their RPI. Yeah, it's, our, help, it's yes. RPI. The rankings don't matter, doesn't matter at all. Last year, was BYU, BYU was number four, but like the 11th seed or whatever. Like, right. it, it doesn't matter. Um, yes, that's the only way they can host, I can see, because that a last second win against San Diego would be incredible. That's on the Tuesday the 22nd, by yeah. the way. Paul Sunderland, Kevin Barnett on the call on ESPNU. They're in the A team on the Olympics. They're coming to call that match. Which Fantastic. Cool. And I heard their statistician's gonna be pretty good. Ooh, you in on that? Me. Let's go, yeah, Jerry. Exactly. Let's go. The Big 12 announced today the formation of their business advisory board. This is awesome. To collaborate and help co-author the conference's business strategy. Yeah. You wanna talk about name dropping from Brett Yormark? Yeah, this, this list is fun. The board consists of 37 successful leaders from the fields of entertainment, finance, consumer brands, technology, media, and more, including on that list, Fraser Bullock, Salt Lake City Olympic bid organizer, Garth Brooks. Uh-huh. Yeah, that Garth and, Brooks. And Chris Gaines. Chris Gaines and Jason Kidd. Yes, the head coach of the Dallas Mavericks. What do you think of this board? This is cool because it's bigger than just sports. Brett Yormark brings in this like New York flavor to the Big 12 to try and expand this thing. He's already inked a deal with ESPN and Fox, which they haven't announced officially, but a lot of smoke on that, right? I like this, this is great. This isn't the Pac-12 trying to work the Pac-12 networks kind of thing. That's not, this is not the same, this is different. They are trying to make the Big 12 a competitor with the Big 10 and SEC. For sure. Uh, uh, hey, third place is pretty good on that. I like being on the medal stand. He is all about the entertainment brand as Brett Yormark and clearly yeah. making that a priority as uh, things ramp up in Big 12 country. Okay, before the game on Friday, San Diego State student section of the show tweeted out the following. <laughs> Let's have a great game today, BYU. Hope you guys play well. <laughs> what? And according to Mark Durant, zero San Diego State students showed up dressed as missionaries. <laughs> How do you feel about the new version of the show? Listen, BYU had won four or five in Viejas and they'd won the last two. Like this was an attempt to try and reverse karma and be like, we'll do whatever it takes to beat BYU, especially at home. Even be nice to them for a day. I'm weirded out by this. <laughs> I, I almost wonder if um, the stuff that happened at Oregon from an administrative standpoint Maybe. influenced them to be Maybe. like, hey, Calm we can down. we can compete in a different yeah. way. I want them to be more aggressive though. Like they don't they don't have to dress up like missionaries, but there's some middle ground there to be more competitive. Yeah, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Less cursing from the show in their tweets, ideally. But like, I don't care. That's uh, up to you. It's just kind of That's weird. not you it's do what you weird. do. You. This is this is elite level. It felt trolling. weird. It felt like a troll because it was too nice. Oh, trolling with kindness for sure. Yeah, killing him with kindness. Men's hoops those Missouri State the Bears coming in Wednesday pregame on BYU TV and BYU Radio eight Eastern time. And is BYU football and their fans still one of the most frustrated fan bases in college football? I'm e frustrated by that logo. Even after the win at Boise State? Yeah, I'm pulling that one out. out. What is that? Get You're riling me up. Go Cougs. But not with Tan. This is BYU Sports Nation. What is that? This portion of BYU Sports Nation is presented by Maersk, your e-commerce logistics shipping partner. BYU Sports Nation is presented by the BYU Store, official outfitter of BYU fans everywhere. Welcome back to BYU Sports Nation live from Studio B. Cody Epps was having a fantastic season, ended by injury. That has been the case for a lot of BYU football players. And now I'm frustrated as I'm about to ask this question that deals with frustration, Jerem. <laughs> Goodness. All right. Big Game Boomer put out his top 10... Most frustrated college fan bases. I was doing fine until I saw that tan. Right? Line. I'll be honest. Okay. 
At number five, BYU. Heard of them. So only Texas A&M, who's three and seven. They were number six in the preseason rankings, by the way. Number one recruiting class? Not making a bowl game. Three and seven. <laughs> Miami, Oklahoma, and Arkansas are the teams above number five BYU. Yeah. Where's Alabama on this list? Aren't they frustrated? <laughs> they have two losses. <laughs> Yeah, what a what a level. Where's, uh, yeah, Oklahoma State definitely should be frustrated. They were ranked in the top oh ten, and now they're they're dealing with an injury to their quarterback, and that that's kind yeah. Of at least BYU's had Jaron Hall all year. I mean, Goodness. yeah, it could be worse. Do you feel like this is fair? Like, is yeah. BYU a top five most frustrated college fan base, even after the win at Boise State? Yeah, <laughs> yay! Uh, <laughs> Twenty-one and four the last two years. We expected this team to be a top twenty team, and and they've been far from it, unfortunately. Uh, hopefully, catching fire here at the end of the year, and. and but, yeah, injuries and ineptitude have, have led BYU to certainly be frustrated. This has been a frustrating season. They can still, they get, they can still capture something. I don't, I don't agree on the salvage the season part. But, like, if BYU can somehow get to eight, it's like, all right, we were hoping for nine or ten. Um, eight would approximate that. But this team was w- returned way too many people yeah. to, for us to be like, yeah, eight's fine. No, it's not. Top 10 most frustrated fan base for sure. I, I don't I mean, that's somewhere in the top ten. Yes. Yeah. And – while the season wasn't salvaged with the win at Boise State, something was salvaged yeah. with that win. I said we before, all felt it. Right? I said we before Boise State, it. if BYU wins the next couple games, we will feel better. It'll feel good. You can, like, positive momentum. But this season will have been lost because this team was too talented in the beginning. Too many injuries, and uh, the defense wasn't good. We enough. wanted at least nine. At least nine. The best we can hope for now is eight, and that yeah. includes winning a bowl game. Hey, eight's, eight's fine. It's not bad. In fact, I'd call it good. It's just not what we wanted. We want a very good to great. Okay, sixth seeded BYU women's soccer plays three seed Stanford Thursday in the second round of the NCAA tournament. Women's soccer, let's go to Eastern on the BYU radio app. Up next, a rise and shout out to some wholesome post game fun. However, before we go to break, all of us at BYU Sports Nation would like to take a moment right now and send a message of support and love to the University of Virginia and their football family, including a number of our close colleagues with immediate ties to the Virginia football program. Last night, three members of the Cavaliers team were fatally shot and two other people were wounded when a gunman opened fire on a bus. Tragic scenario, obviously. We are offering prayers from Provo for all impacted by what happened. We'll be back with more BYU Sports Nation after this. This portion of BYU Sports Nation is presented by Mountain America, the official credit union of BYU Athletics. BYU Sports Station's on demand. Download the free BYU TV and BYU radio apps and subscribe, rate, and review. Our question of the day, what do you want to see over the final two games for BYU football in the regular season? Caleb Plew on Instagram answers, I want to see Nakua and Hall put up an NFL caliber performance against Utah Tech and Stanford. Like numbers? Is that what he means? What does NFL mean in that regard? <laughs> Something that will make the NFL scouts impressed? Yeah, maybe. They're going to look at the FCS tape? Like, I don't know. Well, it's the final two games. Final two that. games, right? Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay, against Stanford, Stanford. yes, yeah. yes. Okay. Utah Tech. Yeah. He says BYU will most likely lose both of those players to the draft. So yeah. I hope BYU can restore some lost stock in themselves during the losses and injuries. This team might not do anything special this season, but those boys still can. Those are men. Yeah, those are definitely men. Those are, those are men. Men making football plays. Our elite voice of the day presented by Pax Healthcare Elevated. Jay Law Smith on Twitter says, final two weeks wish list. A thousand total yards of offense. Combined? Okay. Combined, yes. A hundred points. Combined. Ten carries or catches for the fullbacks. Houston Hamuli touchdown is on my list against Stanford. Houston Hamuli playing? Against Stanford. On the list? Yes. Uh, outside of special teams? J. Law Smith also adds one Sports Center top ten highlight. That's it. <laughs> well, at least the standards. <laughs> so Low. Things. Simple, simple things. Yeah, right? standard of truth has been erected there. Jeez. <laughs> wow. Today's rise and shout out presented by Mountain America, the official credit union of BYU Athletics. Some wholesome post game interaction, according to the NFL, in this tweet from Fred Warner, or featuring Fred Warner and Kyle Van Noy. If you, if you can't hear the audio, the giggle from Fred. <laughs> The giggle is fantastic. It was great. It was great. And then Kyle says, I had to let you get one win against me finally. That's funny. Oh, yeah. Some Patriots Niners games. Uh, uh-huh. Well, uh-huh. Th- did they play when Kyle was on the Lions? Ooh, no. I think Fred, I think Fred, Fred was, was still Fred here was at Brigham. Still at BYU. Fred was at Brigham. <laughs> <laughs> Lucky for Kyle. <laughs> yes. All right. Thanks to today's guest, ESPN's Trevor Maddich. Started in a spitter. We ran out of time.
For Jeremiah Spencer. Spencer. Shout out to Spencer Hadley. A reminder to join us back here in Studio B, just on the other side of Studio B for Coordinator's Corner, live at 2 p.m. Eastern, noon Mountain. Oh, correction, it's bye week. No Coordinator's Corner. Strike that from the record! Go Cougs. We'll see you tomorrow on BYU Sports News.